Okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get started. I there's a problem. There's a problem with the wireless mic. It's getting. It's, I, um, let me see if it's just because I'm close by. So. Okay, it might just be that the feedback is over there. Okay. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Did any of you get a chance to try the numbers out on the implied risk premium spreadsheet? No. Okay, let's do it. Okay. This you did get the spreadsheet, right? Last last week. Okay. I'm gonna pull it up. <laughs> this is actually the you know what? I'm not gonna talk over there, so I'll just point and so you, you kind of figure it out. So this is actually the spreadsheet I sent you last Wednesday. Okay, the email. Um, I'm going to try to set it to today's. Meeting. Because here's what I did. Right? I updated the the S and P 500 to last yesterday's closing, which is 869, which is pretty close to where it is right now because market's pretty flat today. I updated the risk-free rate to 2.98 percent ten-year bond rate yesterday, and I used the gold seek. When I get up there, it's just uh, I'll show you what what happens. I don't even have to do anything. Okay. So. I updated just those two numbers, the index and the risk-free rate. Go to gold seek, set the, goal, the, the, the final number. So basically, you, see, you saw the cell that I was solving for B24. Set it equal to 869. Hit the OK button, and you should get the new. The number as of yesterday closed is 6.51%. That's the implied equity risk premium as of right now. Okay? Part of the reason it's actually come down a little bit is the risk-free rate has kind of crept up, so it's pushed the premium down. So 6.51 percent is the new is the implied premium as of right now. Obviously, that number is going to change over the rest of the semester. Keep your eye on it because in most semesters, I would say don't worry about it. Take the number at the start of the semester, just use it. But these last four months, if nothing else, they've told us that that can be a pretty dangerous practice. Numbers can change pretty quickly. Okay? Any questions about the mechanics of implied premium? There are a couple of loose ends on equity risk premium that I want to kind of cover, and then we're going to move on to betas. Okay? Is it okay? Is it okay now? Yeah. I threw the mic off the edge, so don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> I got frustrated, so <laughs> sorry about that if it's broken. Yeah. Bl bra blame Dan Godet if it happened. <laughs> okay, so here are the loose ends that I want to tie up. Okay? One is when we talk about equity risk premiums, I think we miss the fact that in most investment banks, most consulting firms, they use a fixed number. That number often comes from Ibbotson, comes from somewhere, and it kind of gets frozen into spreadsheets. And the defense they often offer is, we're all using the same number. So at least we're being consistent. You see what they say? In other words, they might be using 4.5% or 4% or 5%, but they're arguing, hey, we're all using that same number, so what's the big deal if it's not the right risk premium? Okay? So here's my first question. Let's assume we all agree to use the 3.9%. Remember the historical premium? 3.9%, 3.88%. Let me round it up to 3.9%. Okay. 
You're all analysts. We're all in the same firm. We all decide to use 3.9% as our risk premiums. As you just saw, the implied premium now is 6.4%, 6.5%. That's coming from the market. If we all use 3.9% risk premiums, and the implied premium is way out there at 6.5%, guess what we're going to find? We don't have to wait till the 15th week for your results to come in. If we all use 3.9% in our discounted cash flow valuations, we're going to find that almost every stock we look at is cheap. It's cheap not because we like the way the companies run or the stock. It's cheap because we've already taken a point of view about the market into the analysis. The point of view we've, we've taken about the market is we think the S&P 500 is undervalued by about 40 to 50%. That's what using a 3.9% premium as opposed to a 6.5% premium means. And if you believe the market is undervalued, not surprisingly, it's going to spill over into evaluations. So what I'm trying to say is even if you're all consistent, if you use the wrong number, if you use too low a number or too high a number, it's going to show up as valuations that are either too high or too low. So if nothing else, we at least have to be familiar, know what the implied premium is to get a sense of what our output is going to be. Okay? Incidentally, until last year, the reverse used to happen. People used to use historical premiums. We're using numbers that were too high relative to the implied premium. So they're far more likely to find stocks to be overvalued. Now it's kind of flipped. The historical premium is far lower than the implied premium, so the numbers are working in the opposite direction. Okay? So keep that in mind when you think about risk premiums. They do matter. Even if you agree on a fixed number, make sure that number is fairly close to the implied premium, because otherwise you're going to get spillover effects into your valuation. So let's summarize where we are. Okay? So if you like, take, yes, Luis. The question was, uh, a lot of companies are announcing dividend cutbacks, buybacks being reduced. How does it affect it? Remember how I computed the implied equity risk premium. I took the cash flows over the last seven or eight years, right? And I estimated what my starting cash flow was going to be next year. Just as a reminder of what I did, I assumed last year's cash flows collectively to stockholders' dividends and stock buybacks were about 30% lower than the previous year, 2008's numbers were about 30 I actually assumed about a 30% drop next year, which would be two back-to-back -back years of 30% drops. So I'm building the implied premium of a cash flow that is about almost 45, 50% lower than it was two years ago. Could I still be overestimating the cash flows? Absolutely. In fact, let me ask you a mechanical question. Let's suppose the true cash flows are going to be even low. I used actually 52 on the S&P 500 as my starting cash flow. Let's, uh, let's suppose I've overestimated that cash flow that it should really be 45. What should happen to the implied premium if I plug in the 45 in there? Should it go down or go up? In other words, am I overestimating the premium by using that 52 when the actual cash flow is 45 or underestimating the premium? Just in terms of eternal rate of return. Got same level of stock prices. If you use lower cash flows, you're going to get a lower internal rate of return, which will translate into lower risk premium. So one, uh, one analysis might suggest that the true risk premium is still 4%. That what's changed is that the cash flows are going to drop by almost, to get to a 4% premium, they'd have to drop by almost 50%, 55%, 60% next year. Is that possible? Absolutely. So you cannot rule out that possibility. I just don't think it's likely, because that would require such a catastrophic drop in cash flows to get to a 4% premium that you wouldn't get that. And here's the other reason why I think it's unlikely. What do we see happening to default spreads even on AAA, AA rated bonds? I mean, here the cash flows are really not in doubt, right? The coupon on a AAA rated bond is going to get delivered to you, even in a bad economy. But look at the spreads we're charging. We're charging twice the spread now than we did six months ago, which tells you that there's, there's some resonance to a risk premium story. It is possible I'm overestimating the risk premium, but it's definitely not what it was six months ago or a year ago. So if it's cash flows that are the problem, it can be only part of the problem. Okay. So let's review where we are. If you take the US market now, you have the historical risk premium. Right now, 3.88%. That's a geometric average long-term premium stocks over T-bonds. If you use the historical risk premium, you're implicitly assuming a reversion back to historical averages, that things revert back. Right? The second premium that I can use is the current implied equity risk premium, current as in right now, 6.51%. If I do that, I'm essentially being market neutral. Do you see why I'm being market neutral? I'm not taking a point of view about the market into my valuation. I'm not saying the market is right. 
I'm saying my job is to value Kraft Foods or SAP. It's not to pass a judgment on the market. It's to tell you whether to buy this particular stock. So if I want to be market neutral, I should really be updating the implied premium to today's numbers. But built in there then will be an assumption that the market today overall is fairly priced. So here's a kind of a melded solution that lets you do both things. Rather than use today's implied premium, which assumes that today's market is right, you could go back and look at the implied premiums over the last 45 years and say, hey, sometimes the market overshoots. Remember 1978? Sometimes it undershoots, 1999? Maybe 2008 is a year like 1978. It was overshot, it's going to revert back to the mean. And you could use a historical risk premium over the last 20 years, which actually puts you back around 4%. I'll give you my gut here. Until this year, I've been pretty agnostic about which risk premium people use. I, I said, now I give you the choices, do what you want. This year, I would strongly push you towards a current implied premium, at least for the short term. Here's what I mean by the short term. I mean, you're going to do a discounted cash flow evaluation. You need, you'll need a risk premium to get a cost of capital next year, two years out, three years out. You will also need a risk premium to get a cost of capital forever for your terminal value computation. This year, I mean, at least in the time we're in, I would suggest that it's probably best to use two different risk premiums. Use the current implied premium for the high growth phase, three years, five years. In the terminal value, if you believe that we're going to revert back to the mean and use a 4% risk premium, I can live with that. But forcing the risk premium to 4% today is, I think, bringing in too strong a view about the market into your company's valuation. And it's going to, I mean, as I said, you're going to get a predictable result. Your company will look cheap at the end of the process if you push the premiums to 4% right away. So if you feel uncomfortable locking in today's premium, saying, that's going to be my premium forever, lock it in at least for the short term, and then start moving the premium down to 4%, but don't let it happen immediately, because I don't think that's going to happen. That's not realistic. So any questions on how you make this choice? Historical, you're assuming reversion back to history. Current, you're assuming the market today is fairly priced, and you just have to value the company. The average, you're assuming that you're going to revert back to the, the market is right on average, but it can be wrong at individual points in time. And you can split the difference by going with the current for the short term and moving towards a 4% in the long term. Okay? In fact, all my DCF spreadsheets actually let ask you for two separate inputs in the risk premium, one for the high growth phase, and once for stable growth. So it gives you the choice. I mean, until this year, you might have used the same number. So why, why did he even put in two inputs? It's precisely for times like this that I want to have two separate inputs to allow you at least the flexibility of changing your risk premiums over time. Okay. Any other questions on premiums? Yes. So you're going to use the two risk premiums, and for the first five years, is going to use a short, short term risk free rate to match those cash flows as well? You could. I mean, you could go your specific risk free rates, but then you'd have to get forward rates. You can't just put your view of interest rates. So if you're thinking about slipping your view of interest rates into the valuation, don't do it. If you're going to go short term rates, fine. Take a one year rate, two year rate, but do it entirely off the forward rate curve, right? Because again, you don't want to bring your point of view about interest rates into your valuation because that'll mix up the two. But that's always an option. You can always do that, even if you don't change risk premiums, right? You can have your specific risk free rates. So you can actually put in a short-term rate, a five-year rate, or one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year rates, and do it. Just don't get too far into that interest rate Pandora's box, because who knows what else you'll find in there. Right? Any other questions? Now, one of the nice things I, I mean, that I like about implied equity risk premiums is think of the inputs, the data you need to get an implied premium. You need the level of the index today, right? You need the cash flows last year, dividends, buybacks. I need an expected growth rate, at least for the short term, in earnings cash flows. Remember with historical premiums, we kind of threw up our hands with emerging markets? Why? Why do we say you could not compute a historical premium or, or get a historical premium for India, Indonesia, Brazil? Not enough historical data, right? But with implied premiums, can you get the level of the index today in any market? If it's a traded market, of course you should, right? Dividends last year, again, many markets, remember, there are no stock buybacks to even worry about. It's all dividends. The only number you might run into a little bit of a roadblock is coming up with the growth in earnings for, unlike the S&P 500, where our analysts actually predict that or forecast that growth rate, it's going to be tough to get that for the Sensex or the Bovespa. But 
you might be able to get there because a lot of stocks in the Bovespa have ADRs on which you can get growth rates at least in a different market. So here's what I tried for the Indian market. I looked up the level of the index. This was September 5th of 2007. Level of the index from the Sensex was 15,446. Dividend yield on the index was about 3.05%. So basically, I just added up the dividends. It's got to be a weighted, a market cap weighted dividend, because that's how the index is constructed. The expected growth rate for the next five years, I cheated. I cheated in what sense? I took the stocks in the Sensex 500, went looking for growth rates. And at least for those stocks, which had ADRs listed on them, I was able to find a five-year growth rate. I was able to actually do this for about 2 thirds of the stocks, because they either have listings in the US or listings in the UK. I took the average of those two-thirds of the stocks and used that as a growth rate for earnings on, the, on, on those companies. Yes? No? Yeah? No, only the large companies, not the good companies. La separate the two. Large companies are more likely to be listed, not necessarily good companies. Right? So remember, it's not as it's you could be a large bad company, and you're more likely to be listed overseas than if you're a small good company. So there is a bias. I mean, I'll admit it. But the alternative is that you sit down and project the earnings growth for each of the companies, and I uh, I don't want to open that box. So, but even if the number that you get is biased, at least you have a starting point, and you can start adjusting that number. Your second question. Well, you could. I mean, you, you could use that. If you assume the growth rate in the GDP of the country is the growth rate in earnings, you could use that. I'm not sure that's going to give you a better estimate, though. Okay. So in this case, basically, I came up with a growth rate of 14% in Indian rupees because I'm doing everything in Indian rupees. Okay. Actually, what I had to do is get dollar growth rates and adjust them to make them rupee growth rate just to be consistent because most of the ADRs, you get a dollar growth rate. I'm almost there, right? I have the index. I have the cash flows. I have the growth rate. And beyond the fifth year, I set the growth rate equal to the risk-free rate, just as I did for the US. I solved for the expected return on stocks. September of 2007, based on where the Sensex was, was then, the expected return on Indian stocks is about 11.18%. You subtract out the risk-free rate, the equity risk premium in September of 2007 in India was 4.42%. That number scared me. You know why it scared me? The implied equity risk premium in the US in September of 2007 was about 4.25%. The implied equity risk premium in Germany was about 4.4%. And here, investors were demanding the same risk premium in India as they were in a developed market. You're saying, but there's growth. The growth is already built in, right, into the premium through the growth rate that I've used. It can't be a growth story. And here's an even scarier number. If you'd gone to the Shenzhen, exchange and computed the implied equity risk premium for Chinese stocks in September of 2007. You know what the number was? 3.5%. In other words, investors were demanding a smaller risk premium in September of 2007 for buying Chinese stocks than they were for Swiss stocks. Now, that's the definition of a bubble. There is no way you can explain that. You can try throwing in higher growth rates, but it doesn't do it. And in a sense, what you've seen since reflects some of that correction. The two markets that have actually suffered the most are India and China, because they're the furthest to fall. And that's why I showed you the table from at the end of last session of what's happened to equity risk premiums across the board. So while you've seen equity risk premiums in the US go from 4.37 to 6.5%, equity risk premiums in India, China, and Brazil have almost doubled, reflecting how low they'd become before. So there's actually two corrections there. One is the overall market correction. And on top of that, you had these emerging markets to overpriced, correcting back to more reasonable norms. So the advantage of implied premiums is you capture that. Historical premiums, it will take a while for this to show up. Default spreads, it will take a while to show up. Because again, you're working with rigid numbers. Implied premiums are much more likely to reflect what's happening outside. So even if you're not going to use them, compute them, get a sense of what they are, and set them to the side so you can see how close you are to that number in the evaluation. Okay. So that's all I had to say about equity risk premiums. Any questions at all about equity risk premiums? So, okay. 
Which brings me to the third and final input I need for the cost of equity, which is the beta. Now, we all know the standard way of estimating betas is run a regression, a regression of returns in the stock against returns in the market index. The slope of the line is the beta, right? Every finance textbook, the one I read, the one you read, oh, no, that's the basic definition of beta. It's a terrible way to think about betas for three reasons. We all know when we run regressions, it's a statistical number, right? A beta is the slope on your regression. It comes with a standard error. He thinks that's always true. What's the big deal? The standard error on beta estimates is huge. So when you estimate the beta from a regression of, of returns on your stock against returns on the market index, you're going to get a slope, but the standard error is going to give you a huge range on the beta. Second, by definition, regression betas have to be backward looking, right? Why? What do I need to run a regression beta? I need returns on the stock. I can't give you the returns for the next five years, so I go back and look at the last five years. Why does it matter? Do companies change over time? Business mixes change, leverage changes. This, forget about what's happening in the market. Companies do acquisitions, they do divestitures, they're all going to get reflected in the true beta, but the regression beta is going to lag those changes because they reflect what your company used to look like, not what it looks like today. And the point about leverage, I think, is a particularly critical one. As your debt to equity ratio changes, your beta should change. You think, but that'll change only if the company borrows a lot of money or pays off debt. Is that true? Have companies' debt to equity ratios, ratios changed across the board over the last four months? And what's the big reason they've changed? The market value of equity has plummeted. There are companies that used to have 10% debt to equity ratios four months ago, haven't done a thing to their debt. And now they're waking up and they're finding 50% debt to equity ratios. If you use a regression beta, you will capture the average debt to equity ratio over the last two years, the last five years, not the debt to equity ratio today, which means your betas will not quite capture the changes that have occurred because your leverage has changed. So let me take each of those arguments and kind of show you pictures to kind of bring home the point. Here's the first one. We talked about the standard error on beta estimates. I call this the noise problem. You run a regression, you get a slope. The slope comes to the standard error. One of the nice things about having a Bloomberg beta for your company is in addition to reporting your beta and screwing around with that beta with an adjusted beta, they also tell you what the standard error on your beta estimate is. So here's an example. This is the beta estimate for Amazon that I pulled up. It's one of the companies I'm going to value in class from 2001. I pulled up the numbers from, for Amazon for those two years. The raw beta for Amazon, according to Amazon, uh, according to Bloomberg, was 2.23, but the standard error is 0.50. So let's do some stat 101. You got a slope of 2.23. The standard error is 0.50. If I asked you for a range on your beta with 95% probability, what, what's a range? 95% is what? Two standard errors. When you run regressions, the coefficients are actually normally distributed. 2.23 plus or minus two standard errors gives you a range for Amazon's beta of 1.2 to 3.2. Fat lot of good this does you in evaluation, right? To know that Amazon could be mildly riskier than the average stock, or 3.2 times more risky than the average stock. It's an extreme case, I know. 0.50 is not the typical standard error, but the typical standard error for a beta estimate in the US is about 0.25. Not trivial, right? So the next time you hear somebody say, Coca-Cola's beta is 1.12, stop them. Ask them, where do you get the beta? I pulled it off a regression. Ask them what the range in the beta is. If they give you a blank look, they have no idea what they're doing, move on. But the range on that beta is somewhere between 0.6 and 1.6. Makes a big difference, right? Once in a while, you might think you've hit pay dirt. And this will happen if you're doing a European company. You go to Bloomberg, you pull the beta page off. And would look awesome when you look at that page. Like, Thank God I'm not doing a US company. In fact, I've saved my, per this is my perfect beta page. When I looked at this page, I said, why can't every company have a beta like this one? See, every point's almost on the line. Standard error 0.03. R squared, 94%. This is not going to be just, this is Nokia. This is going to be true for a lot of European companies, a lot of emerging market companies. And there's actually a very trivial reason why this regression beta looks so good for Nokia. And what is it? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, since uh, we know the, com the company is 
In fact, when you ask Bloomberg for a beta, it's incredibly parochial about where it estimates betas. You ask for a German company, it runs a regression of the German company against the DAX, French company against the CAC, Italian company against the Milan index. Think, so what? The S&P 500, for all its faults, has 500 companies. The largest company, Exxon Mobil, is what, 6% of the index? You take the DAX, you take the CAC, you take the, you're talking about 30, 20, 30, maybe 40 stocks. And if you're running a regression of a stock in the index against the index, guess what you're going to find? They tend to move together a lot. I say this page just to carry this to its absurd limit. Nokia is a Finnish stock, right? So you go to Bloomberg and say, give me the beta for Nokia. Bloomberg does what it always does, runs a regression against a local index. And the local index happens to be the Helsinki exchange, the hex. Now, I'll, be, I'll make a confession. I never really tracked the hex. I didn't even know there was an index called the hex until I ran this regression. So I took a look at what was inside the hex. And there are a lot of Finnish stocks I've never heard about. And there's Nokia. And Nokia happens to be 80%, at least at the time that I ran this regression, 80%, 80% of the hex. So there's your reason. You run a regression of Nokia against Nokia. 80, no, R squares reflect that, the standard errors reflect that. But here's the bigger problem. Step back and think about what beta is supposed to measure. Beta is supposed to measure the risk added by an investment to the portfolio of the marginal investor in that company, right? Would I be able to find out who the marginal investor in Nokia is? What are the two conditions you need for somebody to be a marginal investor? Owns a lot of stock, trades that stock, right? Remember corporate finance, we typed off the HDS page for your company, top 17 investors in your company? I did that for Nokia. At the top of the list was Barclays. They own Nokia as part of their global index fund. Ask yourself a question. If you're Barclays and asking how risky is Nokia, think of how you're going to measure risk. You're not going to measure risk to the hex, right? You're going to measure risk by looking at how much risk Nokia adds to what you already own, which is a global index. Nice thing about Bloomberg is you can actually go in and change that index, right, to whatever you want. In fact, if you wanted a more realistic picture for Nokia's beta, you would rerun the regression, replacing the hex with the MSCI, which is the NF if you, in Bloomberg. If you type an in NFT into the, into the index, it'll rerun the regression against the MSCI. I have some good news and bad news. When you run this regression against the MSCI, you're going to get a more reasonable estimate of beta, a more meaningful estimate of beta. But guess what's going to happen to the standard error when you run this regression? It's going to go up. There's no way out of this box. If you run a good beta regression, you should have a big standard error. You know why? Because most of the risk in a stock is firm specific. That's what the standard error ref reflects, the R squares reflect. If you're running a regression, you show me an R squared of 80, 85, 90%, don't expect congratulations. My response is going to be, that regression is not run right. It makes no sense. A beta regression should have a low, st low R squared and a high standard error because that's the nature of firm-specific risk. So first problem with, beta, with regression betas is the noise. The second is you have to be careful about what index you use. You can get strange numbers. So people very quickly start running into this problem when they, when they start valuing, especially emerging market companies. And then they start asking, how do I get around this problem? I want to dispense with a couple of ways people try to get around this problem, which I think are dead ends. One is to sit in front of the Bloomberg and try other regressions. Hey, here's a classic one. You have a Brazilian company. You run a regression. The traditional regression would say, you know, Ambev against the Bovespa. And for those of you who have any sense of the Bovespa, it's a terrible index. If you're going to create an index that does not work, the Bovespa would be it. It's a trade weighted. It does some really weird stuff. But it's been around so long that people don't want to give it up. But that's what Bloomberg uses. So here's what many people say. Oh, I don't buy into that regression. Let me try a different regression. Okay? For example, Aracruz against a Bovespa. Aracruz has an ADR list in the US. They say, well, I know the Bovespa is not that good, but the S&P 500 is much better. So let me run a regression of Aracruz's ADR against the S&P 500. Better index, but I'm not sure where you're going with this. Your standard error is going to be large. And once I let you start changing the parameters of this regression, you see where this is going to end, right? You don't like this beta, what are you going to try next? You're going to try weekly. 
Then you're going to try monthly, maybe daily. Then you're going to have a different starting point, different ending point. I've told people, you give me 25 minutes. You give me a Bloomberg terminal. You tell me what beta you want for your stock. I will deliver it to you. <laughs> Remember that. Because you will have analysts who put up a beta page from Bloomberg saying, look, look, beta, you're right here. I'd like to know which iteration of beta this is, the 17th time you tried a beta out. It's meaningless for somebody to hold, oh, look, it's a regression beta, trust it. Because regression betas are going to be incredibly sensitive to the choices you make in terms of parameters. So don't even go down that road. Here's a second choice. You can try to estimate a beta. This is back to the previous page. You can try to estimate a beta. The biggest problem, the reason betas are so noisy is the correlation number with the market. Because that's the number that shifts on you. Because if you look at statistically how the slope on the regression is computed, there's the standard deviation of the stock, the standard deviation of the market, and the correlation between the stock and the market. Those are the three statistical numbers that go into your beta. For the most part, I mean, obviously the last four months are an exception, standard deviations are, pretty, are, are fairly easily predicted. At least the ratio of the standard deviations are fairly easily predicted. The number that really throws the beta number off is the correlation keeps shifting on you. So some people say, well, let's take the correlation out of the mix. So what did that give me? What if you took the standard deviation of every stock and divided by the average standard deviation of the market? Beta, after all, is just a measure of relative risk, right? So if I took the standard deviation of, let's say, IBM, 37%, and I divide by the average standard deviation across all stocks, let's say 30%, 37 divided by 30 gives me a number that looks very much like a beta. It's a relative standard deviation number, but it looks very much like a beta. I've seen people use this as an alternative to betas. It is less noisy. But what's the catch? When you use standard deviations, you come up with measures of relative risk. Philosophically, what are you doing differently than when you use betas? With betas, what kind of risk are you capturing? That by itself I can live with, right? In a sense, that's, that I can live with. Okay? When, when I started the beta discussion, though, I did say the kind of risk that beta captures is what kind of risk? Market risk, risk that cannot be diversified away, right? When you use standard deviations, you're looking at total risk, which is fine if you recognize what you're doing, right? Because in a sense, you're abandoning 50 years of risk and return in finance and saying, I'm going to go with total risk. And you might be right. Maybe that's the right thing to do. But at least be aware of that assumption. It makes me uncomfortable because I know there are companies with a lot of total risk with relatively low market risk. They should have low betas, but they might have high relative standard deviations. So I don't like changing the regression beta. I don't buy philosophically into relative standard deviations, which kind of brings me back to the approach that, I, that we used in corporate finance for estimating betas, I'm going to re-emphasize that approach here, which is rather than trust one regression to deliver your beta, or one standard deviation to tell you what the risk is, build up to your beta from the bottom up. Tell me what you do as a business, and I should be able to build up to a beta that is more meaningful for you, a bottom up beta for your company that reflects your risk as a company, reflects where you are as a company, and can even be proactive, can build in what I expect you to do as a company. So we're going to go through that process of bottom-up betas. But I want to first make sure that you're clear about why I'm abandoning, in a sense, what seems to be the conventional practice. Run a regression, get a beta, is I don't trust the number. I don't trust the number because of its noise. I don't trust the number because I can make it shift, depending on the index I use. And you're going to end up wasting so much time trying to come up with the parameters to use for a beta regression that it's really not worth the effort. Okay? Finally, if you don't trust any of these approaches, you might say, I don't buy into betas. I, you know, I've heard people say, I read only Warren Buffett. He doesn't use betas. I'm not going to use betas as well. All the more power to you. But if you, do not, if you decide not to go with beta as a measure of risk, come up with some measure of risk, right? Because the, if your alternative is, I'm going to treat every company as equally risky, that's an alternative I can't live with. Because there is no way you can tell me that Google and Con Ed are of equal, equal risk. So even if your risk measure is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and some expected return to go with it, I can live with that. Because to me, the discount rate is not the end of the process. It's a piece of the process. So I don't want to spend six weeks debating the cap -M. So if you want to come up with a more simplistic way of adjusting for risk, I can live with it. But you, you need to be clear about what you're building into the discount rate and why you're using the numbers you are. Okay? So let's 
start, talk about the bottom-up beta approach. I'm going to I'm going to go through what we did in corporate finance over an extended session. I think a whole session in about 10 minutes. So if you if you feel that I went through too quickly, go back and look at that particular session of the corporate finance class. Look at the webcast because we spent a fair amount of time talking about this. There are only three variables, three decisions you make as a company that affect your beta. Here's the first one. Tell me what kind of business you're entering, what your products and services are, and I can pretty much already start to guess what kind of beta you should have as a company. And here's the dividing line. The more discretionary your products or services are to your customers, the higher your beta should be as a company. Know what I mean by discretionary? If your customers can live without your product, they can delay buying it, they can defer buying it, you should have a higher beta than if they absolutely need the product. In, in econ classes, we have a different term for this, right? Discretionary, non, what, do you, what do we use to measure that? Elasticity of demand. Basically, I'm saying if you have a product or service with elastic demand, you should have high betas. It's inelastic demand, you should have low betas. Let's look at the implications. If you're a cyclical company, you should have a higher beta than if you're a non-cyclical company. If you're a luxury retailer, you should have a higher beta than if you're a discount retailer. Walmart should have a lower beta than Tiffany's. If you sell high price products, you should have a higher beta than if you sell low price products. Because the nature of high prices, it's far more discretion. People are not doing well, they're not going to buy your products. And, but here's the fourth implication, and let's see if you, can, if you agree with this or not. I would expect growth firms to have higher betas than mature companies. I'm saying, what's that got to do with discretionary? It's the nature of the process. If you're a growth firm, you tend to go for a niche product. And you don't provide the base product. So if you're a telecom, small telecom firm, you're not providing the base products and service. You provide me something I will buy if I feel I have the resources to do it. So this might not be true for all growth firms, but one of the reasons I think growth firms tend to have higher betas than mature firms is because the products and services they provide tend to be more discretionary and tend to have higher betas. So that's the first factor, is what kind of business are you in? Second, tell me something about how you run your business. The greater the proportion of your costs that are fixed costs, the higher your beta will be as a company. Do you see why? You have a lot of fixed costs. In good times, you make tons of money. In bad times, you lose tons of money. Everything gets magnified. So businesses with have lot, lot, that's, uh, that have lots of fixed costs, airlines, for, for instance, should have higher betas than businesses with low fixed costs. Maybe human resource companies. I would also use this, for instance, if you're a company with a rigid cost structure, you should have a higher beta than if you have a flexible cost structure. What I mean by rigid is, if you can't adjust your cost quickly as revenues change, I'd expect your beta to reflect that. If you have a flexible cost structure, I would expect the betas to be much lower. And then I started the third sentence, but I never finished it. So you can finish it for me. Young firms should have, go ahead, higher betas. And give me the rationale. What's it got to do with cost structure? What is it about young companies that might lead them to have? Yeah. Young company, you have to start building up your base business before you start selling, right? So initially, at least, a lot of your costs are fixed costs. As you start growing, your variable cost component starts to grow on. Again, I'm not saying this is true for all young companies. But for many young companies, you should expect the betas to be higher than if they're later in the life cycle. Small companies, again, same reaction. You're small, you're starting to build up. Initially, you have a lot of fixed costs. As you grow out, your variable cost component will tend to grow out. So tell me what business are you in. Tell me what kind of cost structure you have. And there's a third and final variable. Tell me how much debt you've used. And the reason debt makes a difference is precisely because fixed costs. Same reason that fixed costs make a difference, right? What does debt do? It magnifies how much your equity earnings are affected by what happens to your revenues. So if you have a drop in revenues, your operating income goes down, right? If you have a lot of interest expenses, guess what? Your equity income is going to change even more. The more you borrow, the more exposed you are to market risk. I know some of these sound like firm-specific decisions. Of course, every one of these decisions you make as a firm. But I'm still looking at your exposure to market risk, macroeconomic risk. And the more debt you have, the higher your beta should be. And with Debt, I can actually be more precise about the relationship between how much you borrow and what beta you have. But ultimately, those are the three things that drive, drive your beta. What business are you in? What's your cost structure? How much have you borrowed? Okay? 
That's the framework we're going to build on to come up with the bottom-up beta. And it's really a fairly straightforward process if you can do it one step at a time. Okay? So here's the first step. You're in a business. I'm going to start off with the beta of the business you're in. This has nothing to do with you as a company. You're a steel company. I'm going to look up the beta of a steel business. Now, part of you may say, how do I know what the beta of a steel business? Let's leave the mechanics till the next page. So if I, gave, if I could tell you what the beta of your business is, I'd start with that. In an ideal world, I would like to adjust that beta for differences between your fixed cost structure and the fixed cost structure of other steel companies. So if you have a more rigid cost structure, I'd like to give you a higher beta. Okay? So first step, get started with the beta of the business. Adjust that beta for operating leverage. And then as a final step, I'd adjust that beta again for how much debt you've taken on as a company. So let's try to put this into practice. Because clearly, I need the beta of the business, leverage of, uh, and, and the adjustments for operating and financial leverage. Okay. Let's take the operating leverage effect. To adjust for operating leverage, I really, really need to know what your fixed costs and your variable costs are. Now, you already see the practical problem with this? You open up a financial statement, the income statement. What do you see? You see revenues, right? Do you see fixed expenses, variable expenses? I wish that we did, actually, because in a sense, the breakdown they give is not particularly useful. They kind of put things together, cost of goods sold, and they have gross profit, operating profit, this, SG&A expenses. What would be really nice is if they said revenues, fixed costs, variable costs, operating profit. If you had the breakdown of fixed and variable costs, here's the adjustment you'd make. You'd start with a pure business beta, steel company beta, chemical company beta. And depending upon what the ratio of fixed to variable costs is, you'd end up with a higher beta or a lower beta. So your beta as a company for the business you're in would reflect both your business choice and your cost structure. Practically, I almost never try to do this because I usually give up. Because it's not just your company. You've got to break down into fixed and variable costs. You've got to do this for every other company in the business. Okay? So unless you have a real outlier, Southwest Airlines, for instance, a company where you know the cost structure is very different from everybody else, it's usually not worth the effort. And most of these computations, what you're going to see is I'm going to assume that if you're in the steel business, your operating leverage is pretty similar to the average operating leverage of the other companies in the business. It's a poor approximation. I wish I could get the fix in the variable costs and do the correct adjustment, but I don't have the information to actually do it right. In fact, if you look at the valuation book, the investment valuation book, I think in chapter eight, taken Van Shoes, which is uh, you know just a shoe company, and computed a pure business bait and adjusted for difference in fixed and variable costs. But it's kind of cheating because what I did was I went and started making assumptions. I said, you know what, GNA is probably <laughs> fixed, you no know, selling expense is probably variable. So I made my judgment calls and made the, made. But basically, to show you that if you had that breakdown. Making the adjustment is actually trivial. It's not difficult to do. It's getting the breakdown that's often the tough part. Okay. Yes? See, you could look. See, you can look for all kinds of clues, right? The question was, can you use information in the balance sheet to back out fixed and variable costs? Remember, these are all steel companies. So you're not comparing companies in different businesses. So the PPNE is going to be the plant cost. So the way accounting works is whether the costs within that steel plant are variable or fixed, you're going to see the total cost of the plant show up on your, plant, uh, on your, on your balance sheet. So I'm not sure. I've tried every, everything I can. And at the end of the process, I always you know, throw up my hands. Maybe you will have more luck with this. But uh, it's very difficult to back out fixed and variable costs from a conventional financial statement. Maybe you have multiple years of statements. You can start to look for clues. But if you have only one or two years of statements, it's very difficult to make the judgment. Okay. Yes? Can you solve this? Actually Where did you there? Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there were two of you. So. <laughs> so if you run a regression of the revenues versus the uh, yeah. costs, Overall. That's why I said if you have multiple years, you can run a regression. But here's the problem. Remember what we said about beta standard errors? Those are going to be multiplied when you run them. You, you see why they're going to be? See, because op, I mean, think of all the screwy things accountants do with operating income, right? So when you start running the regression, you're going to get strict. So in theory, I could run the regression, but I have to make up the company. So the hypothetical company will work great. With a real company, the actual way in which people measure earnings is so messy that backing out the clues is so difficult. It, really, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's difficult to do. Maybe we should start pushing accountants towards 
rather than fair value accounting, giving us information on expenses that we can use to actually make judgments on risk a little better. So that's the first, the operating leverage adjustment. Let's talk about financial leverage. As I said, with financial leverage, we have a much more long-standing convention of adjusting for financial leverage. In fact, it goes back to 1971. A professor at the University of Chicago, Robert Hamada, came up with a way of adjusting betas for financial leverage. And we still use this levered, unlevered beta all the time in finance classes. Here's the equation he came up with. The beta for the equity, levered beta is always betas for equity. It's a function of the unlevered beta, which came from the business choices in your operating leverage, and how much you borrowed as a debt to equity ratio. That debt to equity ratio is a market debt to equity ratio. So as that changes, your equity beta will change. You say, what's that 1 minus t doing in there? Debt is a fixed cost, right? But there is one saving grace to debt, which is it is tax deductible. So the t is in there to capture the fact that the government kind of gives you a helping hand. That's called a Hamada beta. We use it and overuse it and reuse it all the time in finance. But I have to also give you the weaknesses of that beta. That beta computation is based on the assumption that the beta of debt is zero. You can work out the algebra. In fact, it's in the book. They have done the, the, if you look at the footnotes, I quote you. That assumes beta. Not, not that debt is riskless, but that debt has no market risk associated with it. There might be default risk, but essentially the assumption of this model is default risk is not market risk, it's firm specific. That's a fairly strong assumption. But if you make that assumption, the beta of debt then drops out of the equation. All you have to worry about is the debt to equity ratio and the unlevered beta. Now you're going to run into a few people who are pains in the neck. So you'll do this beta adjustment. The guy will put up his hand and say, how come you're assuming the beta of debt is zero? Just to show you he knows this stuff. Here's how you get back at him. I say, quick, give me the beta of debt. Because adjusting for the beta of debt is trivial. If you know what the beta of debt is, I can actually rewrite this equation bringing in the beta of debt. Because effectively what we're doing in the first equation is we're taking all the market risk and loading it up on just the equity investors. So if there are fewer equity investors, they bear more risk. If the beta of debt is not zero, the lenders are bearing some of the market risks, right? which means the beta of equity will actually decrease if you bring in the beta of debt. So you have two defenses. One is, by doing the Hamada beta, which, is, which assumes beta of debt is zero, you're probably going to overestimate the cost of equity. So you're, going to be, you're, being, so you're saying, I'm just being conservative. The other is, if somebody pushes and says, we need to adjust for it, then basically what you need as an additional input is a beta of debt. And if you can bring in the beta of debt, you can actually rewrite the equation with the beta of debt as part of the equation. And all you're doing is apportioning the, debt, the market risk then between the equity investors and the lenders. You're going to end up with a lower levered beta at every level of debt because somebody else is bearing some of the market risk. Okay? So again, the mechanics of adjusting levered betas for debt beta not being zero are trivial if you can get a beta of debt. I actually, in my book, have betas for debt for different ratings classes that I've computed. So if you're, for, and you can probably help me on this. As I go from AAA down to single C, what do you think happens to beta of debt? It goes up, right, obviously. Why? What is it about double C rated bonds or double single C rated bonds that, that makes the beta go up? When you buy a triple C rated bond, you're buying equity in the company. Basically, it's going to behave more like equity than debt, right? I mean, forget about interest rates. You're worried about, will the earnings be there? Will I get paid? So what happens as you move down the rating scale, is the beta of debt does increase. And what effectively also is an implication is when you compute the beta of equity for companies which have double C, triple C, single B ratings and use the conventional approach of beta of debt zero, you're overestimating the beta of the company. Keep that in mind for those of you who are doing distressed companies. You might have debt to equity ratios of 6,000%, 18,000%, 5,000%. You're going to end up with betas of 8, 10, 15, 20. But you are, in a sense, overestimating beta because the lenders in those firms are, in fact, bearing some of the beta risk. Okay. Any questions on adjusting for leverage? Yes. yes. Okay. So what would be the intuition behind uh, uh, coming up with the beta of debt? Like, I'm just thinking purely mechanically. Well, beta of debt, basically, there is market risk in a company, right? Forget about the, the regression mechanics. There's 100 units of market risk in a company. It's got to go somewhere. In the first approach, we take the 100 units and we load it up all on the equity investors. In the second approach, we're saying if you're a bank and you lend money to the firm, at some point in time, in addition to bearing conventional default risk, you're bearing some of the equity risk in your, in your debt. 
So when we say the bait of debt is not zero, that's effectively all we're saying is lenders to the firm, whether they like it or not, are starting to bear equity risk in the firm, which takes away some of the pressure from the equity investors. Okay? So that's why the bait of equity goes down, the bait of debt goes up. And the, the 100 units of risk is still there, just being reallocated. Right. So, so then you would basically, so you're using a default spread to come up with some... No, some the, the default spread is going to be dangerous because the default spread will capture an additional market risk other firm specific risk as well. So it's a portion of the default spread. It's, it's correlated with the default spread, but it's not the entire default spread. You can't back out a beta from the entire default spread. That wouldn't work, but it's a portion. Of the it is correlated with the default spread. So as your default spread rises, right. a bigger portion of that is going to be, equity, is going to be market risk. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So here's my basic framework for estimating bottom-up betas. So you're a company. I'm going to help you estimate your beta. I've taken the regression. I've thrown it into the trash cans. I don't trust that number. First question I'm going to have for you is tell me what business or businesses you're in. That shouldn't be a difficult question. If that is a difficult question for you to answer, then I can't help you, right? Okay. So, so let's play along. Let's assume you tell me that you're in two businesses, steel and chemicals. Yeah, fine. So I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to go out and I'm going to find as many publicly traded steel companies as I can and as many publicly traded chemical companies as I can. Preferably doing only steel and only chemicals, but I might have to fudge a little, say 90% steel, 90% you know, some way of getting companies primarily in steel, primarily in chemicals. They're publicly traded, right? So I should be able to pull up their regression betas. So let's play, let's play along. Let's suppose I find 100 steel companies and 100 chemical companies. So I'm going to get 100 betas for steel companies. 100 betas for chemical companies. I'm going to average those betas up. I'm going to end up with an average regression beta for steel companies, an average regression beta for chemical companies, right? Now, is a regression beta a levered beta or a non-levered beta? It's a levered beta, right? How, do we, how did the leverage creep in there? They just came from a regression. What part of the regression brought in the leverage? What did I do as a regression? I regressed returns on the stock against returns on the market index, right? You have a lot of debt. Your stock returns are going to reflect that. But you can already see that it's kind of a dicey game. It's going to reflect the debt to equity ratio you had over the period of the regression. But those are levered betas. So I have a regression beta for steel, a regression beta for chemicals. Their debt to equity ratios might be very different from my company's debt to equity ratios. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out the effect of debt from both betas. That's called unlevering the beta. You're essentially taking out the leverage effect. And I'm going to use the average debt to equity ratio across steel companies and across chemical companies to do the unlevering. What I'm going to end up with then is two betas which have no debt effect. An unlevered beta for steel companies and an unlevered beta for chemical companies. And I come back to you and say, look, you told me you were in two businesses. Tell me how much value do you get from each business? Now, your first reaction might be, I don't know how much value I get, but I can tell you how much revenue I get, how much operating income I get. It's a good, that's a starting point. A lot of analysts who use bottom-up betas use revenue weights or operating income weights. If you can, I would suggest converting those numbers into estimated values. Yeah. Apply a multiple to the numbers, something to come up with an estimate of value. But you want to basically get a sense of how is this company built up. 70% steel, 30% chemicals. And then you're going to take a weighted average of the two unlevered betas. You're almost there, right? You now have an unlevered beta for your company. Last step in the process, I'm going to come back and ask you, what's your debt to equity ratio? Market debt, market equity. You're saying, which one? Now, right now, a target? Tell me both. So take your debt to equity ratio, plug it into the unlevered beta calculation, I come up with a levered beta for your company. Now, why am I doing this? Because I don't like regression betas, right? Where did I get the 100 steel company betas and the 100 chemical company betas? I got them from regressions. All I've done is replace one regression beta with an average of 100. Where's the savings? It's the law of large numbers, right? You, you can afford to be incredible. You can have, take 100 crappy betas, put them in a pot, stir them up, and the average is going to be magically precise. It's amazing what the law of large numbers can do for us. The biggest sales pitch for bottom-up betas is they're going to be far more precise than any one regression beta. Now, along the way of doing this, you can add additional refinements. Remember the second step where I took the 100 steel companies and the 100 chemical companies? If I really have information about fixed and variable costs, I can adjust for differences in operating leverage. 
In the third step, when I weighted based on revenues or operating income, if I can come up with a better way of estimating value, that's a better way of weighting the businesses. At the fourth step, if I'm worried about the beta of debt not being zero, then I can adjust the levered beta. Of so in a sense, at each step, if you want to add refinements, go ahead. But start with the basic approach so you're not getting bogged down in the mechanics of adding you know, layers of detail, which might make it better. But get the basic number nailed down first. So here are the big pluses. The the, to me, bottom-up betas always beat out regression betas. I, I give the statistics in my corporate finance class, but I might as well repeat it. In an average year, I value about 40 to 50 companies. It has been 14 years since I've used regression beta and evaluation. It's 14 times 50, 700 companies. I've come to the fork in the road, regression beta, bottom-up beta, and I've gone with bottom-up beta. I cannot visualize a scenario where I want to trust my valuation to one regression beta, one slope, with all the noise attached to that number, when I can get a bottom-up beta instead. So here are the three basic arguments for bottom of betas. First is lower standard error, much much more precise estimate of beta. Two, I can reflect your company as it is today, right? If you entered the chemical business yesterday, there is no way your regression beta can ever reflect that, but I can reflect it. In fact, if you tell me what businesses you plan to be in in the next five years, I can bring them into your beta weights because I get to set the weights. And here's the biggest advantage. Let's suppose GE wants to spin off GE Capital. There's a lot of talk about that, right? Your job is to value GE capital. You need a beta for GE capital. You can't run a regression. Why not? What are you going to regress? GE capital is not publicly traded. It's part of GE. But with a bottom-up beta, you can value divisions. You can value private companies. You're out of the box. You don't need past prices. You could have an IPO and estimate a beta. You could have a division and estimate a beta. You no longer are constrained by having to have two years of prices, five years of prices. Remember when I, when, when I let you pick a company, I said, as long as you have one set of financials, you can pick the company? You might have picked a company that's been around only six months. You could try a regression beta, but it's going to be pretty much meaningless. In fact, some of you are doing private companies. If you're doing a private company, you can't even do a regression beta. But a bottom-up beta is always going to be an option available to you even if you don't have any publicly traded information. Okay. Any questions on bottom-up betas? Okay. I mean, there are, there are a few individual details that, that are there. For instance, if you have 100 steel companies, instance, should I do simple averages? Should I do weighted averages? My advice to you is keep it basic. Do simple averages. Don't mess with it. You can unlever each company and average it out. Don't even waste your time. Average first and then unlever. Go the easy route here because you're not going to gain much statistically by trying to refine the numbers at, at the first stage of the process. Luis? For your respect to specific betas, yep. do you use um, a worldwide index like MCI? In an ideal world, I would. But here's the problem. I did the update, what, six weeks ago. Okay? There are 29,300 companies in my sample. So I'm not going to estimate betas for all 29,300. So I went to a service that estimated betas. In this case, Capital IQ. What does Capital IQ do for its betas? It uses local indices. Would I have preferred they use global indices? Yes. But I can't redo the betas. But you know what I fall back on? The law of large numbers. They've screwed up every beta. If I have enough companies in my sample, I am screwing up averages out. That's basically what we're falling back on. And if you have a large sample, it is actually a great argument for increasing your sample size. Okay? So it's true by bringing in companies across different markets with different indices, you run this risk of some of these betas be over. As long as it's not cutting one way for all the companies in a sector, you're going to be OK. It's going to get averaged out. If you have a bias, it always cuts in the same direction. Then you have a problem. It's much tougher to average out. Okay? Yes? Yeah, we'll come back and talk about it. The question is, when I unlever, do I correct for cash? Do you, do you see what I mean by correct? What do you mean by correcting for cash? Why don't you tell them what, what, what you mean by correcting for cash? I mean, if there is a cash uh, percentage in, uh, in the asset price, it will not like, uh, be dependent from the market. So this will, uh, will Push be down your bait, right? So if you take Microsoft, Microsoft is 80% software, 20% cash. You unlever the beta, you're going to come up with an unlevered beta for Microsoft as a company. But the company is 80% software, 20% cash. You're interested in just the beta for software. You, you know the beta of cash is zero, so why are we even working with cash? 
So when you say correcting for cash, when you talk about pure play betas, which is what we're coming for, you want to eliminate the effects of cash from the analysis. And that's actually fairly trivial to do, because if you assume the beta of cash is 0, all you have to do is load up whatever beta you have on the 80% of that software. So the betas I report by business are actually my attempt to get pure play betas. They have no cash effect, no leverage effect. So if you have a software business, I'm saying this is your beta. If you have a cash, the beta is 0, so go ahead and use 0. But I try to clean up for cash. We'll talk about the mechanics of doing that because I'm going to talk a little bit about gross and net debt ratios a little later today because there are actually a couple of ways you can adjust for cash. Yeah. Is that a statement or a question? No, no, I'm asking. Ah, okay. Um, no, because I, I can understand because a lot of people want to punish. You know what? What, what worries you about small companies? That they are more affected by the. They might not survive, right? You're worried about survival risk, which is really a discrete risk. As a general proposition, discount rates are not good vehicles to reflect discrete risk. Same thing with the biotechnology company, right? FDA approval, no FDA approval. Venezuelan company, no nationalization, nationalization. I don't want to mean no pick on. When, um, but basically, these are discrete risks. Trying to adjust the discount rate for discrete risk is a very tough thing to do. So with a young company, here's what I do. I'll use a conventional beta. I'll come up with a cost of capital. Part of me is screaming, that's too low a cost of capital. Punish the company, punish the company. I'm going to value the company. But the value I'm going to get is the value of the company, assuming it becomes a going concern. Now, depending on where you are in the life cycle, you, we know the proportion of young companies that can make it through. Very early in the life cycle, what, two out of five make it through? So the value you're coming up with is for the 40% of the time you make it through as a going concern. Introduce the 60% of the time you don't make it. Your company is pretty much going to be worth nothing because a young company, you'll have nothing to sell anyway. If it runs out of business, there'll be nothing to get. Your expected value for the young company will then reflect both the risk of the business they're in and the chance that they don't make it. Same thing with distressed companies, right? We'll, we'll talk, at both ends of the life cycle, companies give us trouble. Really young companies and companies which are on the verge of disaster, right? So we'll talk about bringing in discrete risk, but discount rates, betas are not good places to kind of show them, okay? Any other questions? So let's try a few bottom-up beta estimates. And in the process, I want to deal with a few issues that come up in the process of using bottom-up betas. Okay. This is a bottom-up beta estimate for SAP, a very un-German German company. Okay. It's, it's a classic, it's a, it's a technology company that in a sense, you know, com, you know, is nimble, flexible, does everything you know, on the spur of the moment. That's why I call it a very un-German German company. German companies are very good at doing things and doing it you know, the same way. So I was valuing SAP. This is from a couple of years ago. So I tried two different ways of valuing SAP. The first is a conventional way that I just described. I broke them down into two businesses, software and consulting. I got this out of their annual report. Okay? They gave me the revenues they got from the businesses. 5.3 billion, that's actually euros, and 2.2 billion euros. Now, I could use those as weights if I, if I got desperate. But here's how I converted the revenues into estimated values. Remember those publicly traded companies from which I got the betas for each business? I also looked up one more number for each of those companies. I looked up the multiple of revenues that these companies typically traded at. So for instance, software companies across the sample I looked at typically traded at 3.25 times revenues. So these are the publicly traded software companies I'm using as comparables. They typically traded 3.25 times revenues. See where I'm going with the 3.25? I have the 5.3 billion in revenues that SAP gets from software. Software companies typically trade at 3.25 times revenues. I multiplied the 5.3 by 3.25, came up with an estimated value of 17.23 billion. I did the same thing for consulting. 2.2 billion. Consulting companies typically trade at two times revenues. I multiplied the 2.2 by 2 to come up with an estimated value of 4.4. Those are my estimated values for software and consulting. Those, then, are used to come up with the weights. So 17.23 divided by 21.63 is 80%. 4.4 divided by 21.63 is 20%. The way I see it, SAP is 80% software, 20% consulting. Those are the unlevered betas I got for the businesses based on the comparable companies. I took a weighted average. Weighted average bottom-up beta for SAP is 1.25. That's a fairly conventional beta estimate based on businesses. But I'm going to give you another way to approach betas. SAP is a B2B company. 
You know what I mean by B2B, right? It's customers or other businesses. It doesn't sell directly. I don't have any SAP products. Do you have any SAP products? All right. All right. So mostly they sell to other businesses. In their annual report, they have a pie chart. And in the pie chart, they tell me what kinds of companies form their client base. You see why this matters? Let's suppose you're a company right now that sells software just to banks. Are you doing well? Unless you have software that tells banks how to liquidate themselves and claim top <laughs> funds. And that's a good idea, actually. Rewrite the software. Forget about all the conventions. This is how you maximize your claim on the top funds. You're suffering, right? Because your risk is a reflected risk. So one way to think about risk is rather than think about what you do, think about who you serve. And if they're doing badly, say, I'm going to do badly as well. So the other way I could have estimated betas for SAP is to look up the betas for each of these client businesses and build up. Will I get the same answer? Probably not. Which one do I believe? It depends upon how much I think the risk in this company is reflected. If I think that this company is so dependent on its client base that it can't do much, I'm going to go with the second approach because I think it's more reflective. So if you're a real estate company in Florida, in Orlando, the beta I should be using for you should be a tourism beta. If you're a real estate company in New York, the beta I might use for you is a financial service company beta because your risk is so much a reflection of how those sectors do that it might be inappropriate to use a real estate beta for you because you're really not a real estate company given your client base. So if you have companies that have a very specific client base in a, in a particular sector, think about this alternative as a way of estimating betas. But they're both bottom-up betas. Okay? So think out of the box. Don't get too caught up in SIC codes and industries and sectors, because there's too much of that focus. Step back and think about what you're trying to do in this estimate. Second example, Embraer, Brazilian aerospace company. I went looking for a bottom-up beta. Initially, I looked for other Brazilian aerospace companies, and I ran into a bit of a problem. You know what the problem is, right? Embraer is the only one. So I said, that's good. fine. I'll do Latin American aerospace companies. And I ran into a sample of one. So I said, this isn't working. Emerging market aerospace companies, still a sample of one. This is not going anywhere. So I said, why am I even so focused on what market a company is in? After all, beta is a relative measure of risk, right? There's no currency attached to it. So if I can find the beta of Airbus and Boeing and Bombardier, I don't see why I can't use them in my sample. So here's where I ended up. I looked up the betas for aerospace companies listed globally. In an ideal world, I'd rerun all these betas against the MSCI to get betas that are actually comparable. But I don't live in an ideal world. So I took the betas as is, threw myself at the mercy of the law of large numbers, and ended up with an average unlevered beta across these companies of 0.95. Keep, keep your, this is a ploy you will have to use in many emerging markets because if you define bottom-up betas purely in terms of companies within your market, you're very quickly either going to run into really small samples of strange companies or you're going to find no companies at all. The unlevered beta I used was 0.95. The levered beta I ended up with was 1.07 based upon the debt-to-equity ratio for Embraer. So here's my question for you. This is obviously, an easy, you know, in fact, uh, if you go to my website and look up the betas, uh, I have the betas by sector. This year, I've started reporting global betas. Basically, for any business, you can look up global betas. So basically, I have traditionally, I've reported betas broken, breaking the world down into four regions, US, Europe, emerging markets, Japan. And Australia and Canada have been rump markets. I'm never sure where to put them. Because wherever I put them, they get insulted. If I throw Canada with the US, they say, how dare you kind of treat us as a kind of an adjunct to the US. If I throw Canada, in fact, this year I got into trouble. Because when I was creating the data, it was 29,000 firms. And I was actually manually going down by country and putting the region. And I got tired. And I made Spain into an emerging market. No, I, wasn't, I didn't intend to do it. And I, I, put out the, I put the data set out. And within an hour, I got 150 emails from Spain. Saying, how dare you make us an emerging market? OK, this is go in line. Right after Lebanon, after I've destroyed them, I'll come for you, right? Okay? 
I also did throw Monaco into emerging markets. Only two people emailed me. I think that's the entire population of Monaco, <laughs> interest in betas. You know? yeah. But the, historically, I've broken the world down. into four. This year, I have actually added the global betas. So basically, if you have an aerospace company or a steel company, you can go look up the betas. But here's my question. Is that always kosher? Can I take an emerging market steel company and use global steel companies? In fact, many Brazilian analysts use US companies for their comparables. They're too lazy to even go global or emerging market. They take uh, Ara Cruz, let me look at US paper and pulp companies. Is that always kosher? Is it OK? When is it not OK? I mean, obviously, with Embraer, I believe it's OK that aerospace companies are aerospace. They sell into the same market. They have the same cost structure. When do you think it's not appropriate? Yeah. In the, uh, in the local markets. So if they're within the economy, the local economy. I can live with that. I, I mean, what, what was the first of the three determinants of betas? What business you're in? And the question we asked was, is it a discretionary product or service, right? And we said the more discretionary the product or service, the higher your beta should be. Can you think of products and services that might be non-discretionary in a developed market that are discretionary in an emerging market? Telecom. In fact, I got an email. This is actually extremely timely. Just before I came in, I got an email from Brazil. And the Brazilian regulatory authorities have this year assigned a beta of 0.266 to Brazilian telecom companies. Um, actually, to Brazilian utilities. They've actually done it for Brazilian utilities, based upon what US utility betas are. You know why this matters, right? As a utility in Brazil, you're, the prices you're going to be allowed to charge are going to be based on the beta. So today I get a frantic email saying, the regulatory authorities, this is from somebody in Semex who's been affected by it. And the regulatory authorities have chosen to use 0.266. Those are the betas for US utilities. Can you write a little letter saying this is not the right thing to do? First, I'm not sure that that's my place. But maybe you can write the We'll write a collective letter as a class, right? What is the argument you would use again? I think the 0.266 is not appropriate. I think it's too low for a, for a Brazilian utility. But what, how would you kind of marshal your arguments? You can't tell me that the regression betas for US utilities are wrong. Because you open that door, you don't want to close it. Yeah. One is, there is a big regulatory issue, right? If you have British utilities and US utilities, for instance, British utilities conventionally have much higher betas than US utilities because many British utilities have been, have been kind of opened up to a marketplace. Many US utilities still operate in regulated marketplaces. Prices are set. Production is set. So the first issue is, are you controlling for regulatory differences across markets? Second issue is, you could actually argue that Brazil has a growing market. Utilities are far more dependent on growth. Then US utilities should not be dependent on growth. They're not going to get growth in power production. They're kind of dependent. The population is stable. Everybody has power. The economy does well or badly. It's not like you're going to be turning off the lights more often in your house. But in emerging markets, you could actually argue that products that we view as kind of given, as kind of non-discretionary in developed markets, could be much more discretionary. Which also means that we're making an argument for higher betas for emerging market utility companies and for developed market utility companies. Of course, I, the pra I have to offer them a practical solution. So after I've made all this argument that US utility betas should not be used, how do I kind of close the argument? What do I offer them as long alternative? Use 0.8. Oh, no, no, that won't work. You know. You can look at emerging market utilities. In a, in a sense, why are they looking at US utilities to come up with the beta for a Brazilian, why not look at emerging market utilities? If you can find a way to control for regulatory differences, bring them in. But this, that's a case where you might be on pretty dangerous ground, just taking the bait out of a different market and using it. Okay? So for, for some companies, you can get away with global betas. But for other companies, you might revert back and say, I'm going to use just emerging market betas or developed market betas, because that product or service might not be the same degree or the same degree of elasticity of demand in every market, and that can affect the betas. Okay. Any questions? Yes? What happens if you have a market which has got, I mean, which there's got a lot of unmet demand? For example, India is 30%. Well, that's discretionary. Yeah. Unmet demand only if they have the money to pay for it. I mean, some that's where the growth comes from. So if the economy does well, so here's the rationale. If the economy does well, a lot of that unmet demand is going to become 
realized demand, which is going to show up as growth in revenues, growth in income for these companies, which effectively also means that if the economy is not doing well, these companies are hurt a lot more than Con Ed is, which is really an argument for, for higher betas for those companies because they're more dependent on the economy doing well and growth delivering revenues than utilities in developed markets. Okay, so that's actually an indirect argument for higher betas for those companies. Okay. Yes? If I get desperate, I will do whatever I need to, to get a large sample. And I really mean, I'll tell you why, I mean, because you have a good point. If I could, I'll, I'll start off with a, with a narrow definition of comparable. So with cement companies, I might say, let me just start with cement companies. In fact, I might say just small cement companies. If I get 45 companies come through, I say, OK, I'm done. But if I get four, then I have to start kind of expanding. So I would normally not start going up and down the chain unless I'm not getting enough companies. So if you're doing theme parks, for instance, there aren't that many publicly traded theme parks in the world. So you might have to start moving up and down the chain to see who feeds in. So start narrow and widen out. Because if you start wide and you end up with 1,800 firms, then you can say, what do I do next? So, but but you, there's nothing wrong economically with kind of stretching the definition to bring companies in because they're all affected by the same kinds of risk. Then they should share a similar beta. Okay. Any, other, any other questions? Oh, sorry. Gross debt, net debt. Those of you who worked in Europe or Latin America, you know the convention there is when people talk about debt ratios, they talk about net debt ratios. What's net debt? They take total debt and subtract out cash. So if you have two billion in debt and a billion in cash, they will take the two minus one and report a net debt of one billion. Will it make a difference? At first sight, it looks like it makes a huge difference. Take Embraer. Embraer's gross debt ratio is 19%. That's what I used to come up with that levered beta 1.07. But their cash balance was actually higher than their gross debt. So their net debt was actually negative. The net debt ratio is actually minus 3.32%. So let's say I unlevered the beta using a net debt ratio. I'm going to get a result that at first sight looks incredibly strange. My levered, my levered beta is actually going to be lower than my unlevered beta. This freaks analysts out. First, negative debt ratios and a levered beta. So how can that be? Stick with it. If you want to use net debt ratios, this is exactly right. Your beta is going to be a low number, which means your cost of equity is going to be lower, right? But will your cost of capital also be lower? How do you cost, how's your cost of capital computed? It's cost of equi equity times the weight of equity, cost of debt times the weight of debt, right? With a gross debt approach, I'd have ended up with 85% equity, 15% debt. Debt, of course, is cheaper than equity to push the cost of capital down. With a net debt approach, my debt ratio and my cost of capital is going to be minus 2.5%. Equity is going to be 102.5%. So whatever I gain by having a lower beta, in my cost of equity computation, I will end up losing in the cost of capital. So my advice on gross debt and net debt is pick one and stick with it. Don't go back and forth between gross debt and net debt because that's going to get you into trouble. I prefer to use gross debt ratios because cash can be here today, gone tomorrow. They can do a buyback. They can do something with the cash. So I prefer to treat the two separately. But if you insist on netting them out, net them out all the way. And even if the number is negative, stick with it. You can have a negative net debt to equity ratio. This 0.93 reflects the fact that there is a lot of cash in this company, and it's got to be built into the beta. So you can live with that, as long as you use that also in your debt ratio and your cost of capital. Okay. So if you get a chance, assuming you've picked a company, print off the regression beta, take a look at it, throw it in the trash can. I'm not kidding. That's all I want you to do. Don't get too caught up in trying to analyze that number, because you're trying to analyze something that can't really be rationalized away. Then try to do a bottom-up beta. Okay? So we'll talk on Wednesday.